You now have in front of you um, an august selection of uh, New Zealand's finest uh, uh, venison sales and marketing uh, expertise. Um, so I guess following on from uh, the, the presentations before the tea break, um, this is the opportunity of the, of the audience to direct some questions um, to one or multiple members of the group. Um, we will also, we've also got the DINs board um, down in the front row here, ready to respond to anything um, too curly for Innes or I, um, or about um, DINs activities more broadly, if you'd like to move on to that. Um, but I suggest we start out focusing on um, any questions to do with the, the presentations you've seen, um, either on the, uh, the Savannah trial or on people's, uh, shall we say, um, ongoing uh, marketing programmes. So, um, just uh, over to you, audience. Who, who would like to go first? I should say we're also um, we're open to questions from um, the the internet and the Twitterverse and such like. So there might be some of those come through, but um, we'll see how that goes. Who's going to go first? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, I noticed that uh, on the video that um, Ben mentioned that venison from New Zealand was. GMO free, um, how much of a threat do you think the introduction of GMO into farming, into widespread farming in New Zealand would, would be to marketing venison to some of those countries? I might give that one to Jared in the first instance, given that Ben's uh, closest working partnership. Um, yeah, certainly, yeah, Ben is, is interested in the GMO free. I, I, I think uh, it's the way we, First lot operates is it's a producer group, um, so it's a known group of farmers growing to a known farming system, and so therefore we've been able to get GMO free around that. So it's just a, it's a parcel of product, a parcel of farmers. Um, so we're not suggesting that should be widespread across the country, nor nor will it be. But there's certainly a market niche for it, some customers looking for it, and I think um, with a producer group concept, you can you can deliver that. So we're doing it on our beef as well as our venison. Uh, but Jared, the question was, how much of a problem uh, would it be if we introduced GM into New Zealand for that customer or, or any generally? Thanks for that, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose uh, I'm not trying to solve New Zealand's GMO status. <laughs> uh, I think there are opportunities, niche opportunities out there, which potentially, even if New Zealand went GM, not that I'm advocating that, uh, there's still op opportunity for the likes of producer group models to still be GMO free and to prove it and, be, and do it for a market reason, for a market premium. Yeah. So would a change in New Zealand's status affect your one-on-one your -on -one relationship? Okay. Sharon, you... Uh, yeah, we've researched it extensively and um, with the premium consumer it will be an issue. So we need to be careful. With that target market they're expecting it to be GMO free. Just to add to that, there was, and we should probably dig it out, there was a government report done probably seven or eight years ago that said the benefit to New Zealand farmers through having access to GMO crop far outweighs the disadvantage to consumer pricing of New Zealand's products offshore from us not being able to state we're GMO free. Now that was done some years ago, so that probably needs to be reviewed and, and decisions made about is it ha will it have a major impact on the value of our products or not? Because the, 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 the general view at the time was that so much of the product which consumers are already eating, in terms of particularly meat products, is already feeding on GMO-based crops, that the retailers won't go there because they can't, because most of what they sell is already feeding on GMO. So it, it's a hairy question, and it's one though that probably we need to look at where New Zealand sits as far as its general policy is concerned. Andy? Yeah, hi, I have a, a question for Sharon, um, uh, Sharon Angus, um, and it's in regard to Steve Carden's uh, uh, great address yesterday where he was um, extolling the health benefits of venison over other red meats, i.e. Uh, venison has less fat than lamb or beef, it has less cholesterol than lamb or beef, it has more iron than <coughs> lamb or beef, it's actually very healthy food. So when are we going to start seeing our major venison exporters 
um, taking advantage uh, of these superior qualities um, and, and extolling them in the marketplace. That is venison over the virtues of lamb and beef. Well, we do targeted marketing for the health benefits of venison. So we do market into uh, mediums that, like the healthy magazines, that, the, that segment that are looking for it. Uh, that we've, I've researched many segments on if you do just targeting to that attribute of health, then you are excluding where our main segment is, which is premium protein consumers. So you've got to, when you actually identify a size of the target that you're going to market to, you've got to make sure, one, it's big enough to market to, and you will get enough size of the mass that you're trying to do. And ours is premium protein consumers, and it's about taste and an experience. But we make sure, especially with the huge coup that we've got of the double heart tick, that we're targeting mediums of that <coughs> consumer that it is into a much more healthy, what we would call a control segment of marketing. So you, you have a limited segment, and that size of it, when we've researched it, is much smaller than the target that we're targeting with taste and protein as a premium. Does anyone else want to have a go at that? Um, with apologies, um, I, I did know the slide I only that Steve was using the nutrition comparison table off our website to make the point that we weren't making nutrition comparisons. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also just, if, if you were here in the room, I'd suggest you look at our German language website for the nutritional information, which is targeting Germans, and the Swedish information, which is targeting Swedes, and the Italian website. And a French one too. <laughs> I'd also suggest he flips the pack in our research on our website and the, all the nutritionists on the back. You just have to be in the clever way of flipping pack and doing it on a much more type of way of looking at it. So we have all the nutritionists on the back of the retail pack. What else we got? We got uh, John Sumville, then Steve by the looks. Yeah, I've just got a, a question uh, about the uh, Sissit Savina um, obviously being started in, in Holland and, and it's great to see it underway. Um, but if you work out that project, it's planned to be a bit, to comprise about 20,000 animals, which is about roughly 5% of the kill. So what, in the short term or coming up, what further plans are underway with a, with a similar project with the Savina thing? Because it's obviously you know, a small percentage of our kill. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll have a go at that quickly, um, John. So. Um, and then, then take it to anyone else who wants to have a crack. But um, so, so we've, as we've said, the, that uh, market development side of the P2P project includes, um, first of all, because it's kind of easy and, and quick, a, a European element, which was you know something around the 300 ton ambition that, that Jared mentioned, um, and then a, a, a new markets or a Chinese type element. Um, so we would hope that you know that would provide a similar number. So. Um, that, that 300 tonne in either market represents, in fact, that's a bit more than what I put on my slide, around a 20% increase in chilled volume. So um, we send about 2,500 tonne of chilled product at the moment. So two lots of 300 tonne um, fully hits out that 20% target. Uh, in fact, I think those are probably conservative targets, but you know, it's probably better to under-promise and over-deliver um, rather than, rather than um, promise you something we don't think we can do. Uh, anyone else want to? No. Yeah, I, I think it's important that whilst we're all collaborating on the PGP initiative and in Savina, we're also all got our own company plans as well that are synergising with that. So um, you saw Sharon show that we're about to launch into Singapore, a market that we traditionally haven't done very much at all with venison. Um, all of these new markets, some of them will work, some of them won't work, but they all will be going to build premium chilled programs for, for venison. Uh, Steve first and then one at the back, Tony. Yes, um, thanks Dan. Um, you answered my question. <laughs> that was it, so. Um, I thought of another. <laughs> 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 but just, yeah, just asking the marketers, what's the interest cost of paying the farmer uh, 10 days after slaughter to selling in the market? Uh, you know, the DFA have talked probably a number of years over owner account. We've never really had a satisfactory answer back 
from the marketing side. I know there's a, a number of uh, farmers that are prepared to carry their product with some companies um, and carry that interest cost. What gain would we get by carrying that interest cost as farmers? Volunteers? I thought you might be scared. I, I just don't know the answers. <laughs> Um, the interest cost is, so we pay at 60 days compared to 14, so the difference is about 5 cents a kilo between the two. The, um, so, so I mean, I'll, just in general terms, I don't know the dollar answer, Steve, but um, this is one of the, those points about moving to chilled rather than frozen, is that if we can sell chilled in um, December, um, not only do you get a higher price for the product, but you avoid the fact that the stuff goes in a store paid for to you incurring those interest costs either either by the processor in New Zealand or by a customer you know in Europe who puts it in their own store and finances that product um, refrigerates it and, and critically takes the risk on on what the price is going to be in eight months time when they pull it out of that that freezer so that risk premium is another one that you need to take into account as well yes Dan but also my point about this is that I have worked in the meat industry and I can see carcasses building up in chillers and marketers out in Europe, wherever they are, in a hurry to move product. And if it's on farmer's account, they can afford to carry that risk longer and therefore be able to create a better price for us in the market rather than having to sell to clear those chillers. Glenn? It doesn't always work that way. And, and if, you're, if you have a a market which is definitely under pressure, and let's just look at, let's say, lamb at the moment, which is under some pressure because of the Chinese situation. Holding the product for another three months, uh, that, that price could be considerably lower or it could be higher. So there's a risk it could go either way, Steve. So you're not, all, all you're doing is taking on more risk. Yes, it can go either way, but I don't think you're actually providing any benefit to yourself. When you when you're paid early, I think that's the key point here is risk. You're paid early and you transfer all the risk to the, to the marketing company. Once they've been paid, they've transferred it, as we talked about in that value chain, they've transferred that risk to the, the company in the market. They're then, they've bought the product at a particular price with the hope that eventually they're going to sell it at a, at a reasonable margin. But it doesn't always work that way. If we still, if you as the farmer still own that product in the market three, four months from now, there's, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to get a better price. So you, you, it's not only an interest cost, it's the risk factor that you're going to, to, to take on at that point. Yes, but my risk starts 10 months before it mating. I'm already carrying a 10 month to a year risk anyway. So what's three months if I'm going to get an extra couple of bucks a kilo? I think, I think that we'll, we'll let the marketers know that there's a market there to offer a uh, owner's account option if you think there's a sufficient demand for it, folks. Um, question down the back of the room. Hey guys, um, today we heard about Silver Plume's Farms um, social media campaign and the success that they're having around that. We also heard a couple of comments around the Savannah and the need for an app around it. Um, my question is about your social media and the part, part of venison marketing that plays for us as farmers to connect better with our customers and for feedback, um, feedback from the customers back to us. From, and it's an open panel question to all of you, really, about what your social media um, marketing strategies are. Well, I'll start off. Uh, we have heavily moved to social media in the last couple of years because for us it's about connecting with a whole food experience. You can have a conversation with a consumer far more over social media. We post two times a week with different things and we have interaction with those consumers a new thing that we're doing with Bayara, big media in um, New Zealand and works also internationally is word of mouth and talking about our product is the best thing you could do for marketing. So we're seeding, uh, for example, we're finding 150 foodies. We're seeding venison product and lamb product to them. They have to have a dinner party. Uh, they will talk about it and then they'll blog. So we will measure how much extension of talking about venison or lamb will then go and we start that next week but for our social media it, it is about targeting and you've got to know your target market it's targeting their lifestyles there is absolutely no point in doing mass social media you'll get no gain 
So it's about knowing who you're, is buying your product, then working out what their lifestyle is, and then targeting the media that they're looking at. Uh, because you will waste, and we don't have enough money in this industry to spend a lot on marketing, you will waste a whole lot of money. So um, don't just get bought up in the, um, the social media without it being really targeted social media. Um, so we're on f Sorry. <coughs> Facebook sites uh, for venison, for savina, for New Zealand hash, um, but they are reactive sites. Um, we don't spend a lot of money promoting them. We don't buy a lot of friends. I don't have many friends, Graham. Um, also Twitter, uh, my two friends on Twitter. Um, so, they, but they're they're reactive, so that we have a presence in social media, so that if an issue arises, we can become part of the conversation immediately. Um, and there was an issue a couple of years ago with a chef on an American television program who got criticised for using New Zealand venison. Uh, we were able to then immediately leap into the social media conversation around that, and put across some very good points around. Uh, New Zealand, the sustainability of New Zealand production, and I think probably its nutritional value as well at the time. Um, so yes, we, we have a, a small presence. So, so just from a DIN's perspective, it's actually, um, I mean, the, the medium's cheap, you don't have to pay for TV advertising, but having a person manning um, that social media 100% of the time is, is quite resource intensive. So it's not something we've gone down the track of in terms of our marketing budget thus far, but. But that, that could change. It is really um, resource uh, heavy, but you, we have internal people now that um, are looking after it. Just so you understand, if you're going into international markets, you can't go above the line. You can't do marketing. I mean, even the things that we've tried to do here with young chefs or marketing spend, you're much better spending the marketing. Like, for example, when we did research in the Middle East, uh, the females are sitting six hours a day on Facebook because they don't work, they don't drive, and they're, they're watching everything that's going on there. So you're, as we're looking at our social media, it will be how we go into China, Middle East, in a very targeted social media strategy because that's the only way we're going to be able to talk about our product. We're not going to be able to advertise on TV or magazines because it's too expensive in those countries. So, so one part of the original question that I'm, I'm going to get in trouble with you guys again on uh, was about drawing farmers into that social media conversation about marketing the product. Have, have you guys got anything underway or plans in that area? Anyone at the table? Um, yeah, we're talking to farmers um, continually on Facebook. We actually have one of our staff members that is a farmer's wife. And for example, we had a great, uh, she put out to all the farmer's wives which um, you know, is quite a different target for us, um, and worked with our event manager, Bernie, down the back, and she had her farmer's wives come in by social media, or would you like to see our plant? So we organised the whole event over social media and started the conversations with the farmer's wives on what they found beneficial about learning about our marketing and our um, type of uh, processing. So we're very much looking at how we can target the people that are using social media, which tends to be normally a lot more the females in farming industry. Sharon, how did the, how did the, uh, the ladies um, react to that involvement? Um, they felt really special, which um, I suppose I felt quite sad about, and that not enough's done for um, a very important part of the partner of farming. And they understand our marketing far better. I mean, we also got a group of farmers to um, come to our premier selection uh, chef, and they came down to Dunedin and actually experienced the food. And we brought them into the office and I get far more questions about marketing and the convenient lifestyle and what products suit them from the, the female farming partner than I ever do from the male. And they're our target market. Yeah. I'm going to draw this one out one more time. Sorry, Andrew, you're next. Could you have a conversation that involved both the consumer and the farmer? Well, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I suppose that's what we say with our plate to pasture. For example, the one that we did with our winner of the awards in New Zealand is we got, we actually got consumers to pay. We've got a deal with Mind Food. They talk about the farmer. We have farmer stories every month. Uh, they um, put out for consumers to come to the dinner and that we're going to have uh, our um, chef 
and then we invited the farmer's wife. So we had the whole chain there. And you cannot get a farmer more proud than seeing a beautiful dish. We actually cooked venison uh, for the entree. Um, we did venison, poor people, they got venison, beef and lamb. Uh, a very meaty dinner for the night. Um, but I've never heard such comments and it's never been an event that I've never had so successful. So successful, in fact. And see, that consumer is paying $120 for the ticket, so we're not funding it. Uh, what Mindfood do is get the wine, we supply the meat, and they do all the organising. So, uh, a huge success. Thanks. Dan, uh, from our 36 online at the moment, Tony Chaston, what effect will the lower slaughter numbers predicted have on per animal processing costs? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you'd have to assume that some rationalisation has to occur. So, you know, we're going to be reducing the, the numbers of animals processed by around 25%. You would think that we're going to have 25% too many deer plants. So the question will be about where and, and how and, and different companies taking a different view. Unless someone has a different view. All right. Uh, oh, I think um, Andrew uh, Peters is next in the line. Yeah, you Scotty. see, Aunt Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing excites my wife more than a big check. <laughs> <laughs> she can take or leave the Facebook stuff. <laughs> when Dan's got this revolution started, <laughs> and we're killing 700,000 animals, can you guys handle it? <laughs> You've got to remember, you're not killing many animals right now. And the value you're adding to anything at the end of the day is quite a small package. When we're killing 700,000 animals, can you still do the same? We have uh, latent capacity in the Alliance Group uh, now, so there's a double shift will only work for a short period of time. We have capacity in the existing two sheds, so <clears throat> excess numbers will not be a problem. Um, when they come, could be an issue, so it's going to be about seasonality, it's going to be about the spread of kill, but I'm sure we can manage it. The, the issue, Andrew, that um, I don't think processing is going to be the issue, but the issue in any industry where you get a big increase in volume is that if you do have some really high value niche markets, um, then the value of the product that's going into those high value niche markets is, tends to be diluted because the marginal production ends up being traded at the, at the marginal price. So um, big, big increases in production tend to um, result in the, the median price, this is theory, you know, the median price of products going down. Um, but more importantly, you know, they, they can have market impacts as well. So if you flood the market with, with supply, you'll get a, you'll get a supply-demand imbalance and you'll get a drop in price. Well, it, that, that was part of the uh, emphasis of the question is, is not the processing, it's the marketing. Yep. And, uh, and if this increase is going to happen, and it is, uh, then this uh, marketing has to be catering for this, it, 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 we shouldn't have to tolerate lower value just because of extra volume. That's what I was getting at. Understood. We'll do our best, Andrew. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have a bit of a crack at answering that. If, if all of a sudden we almost doubled the volume of uh, deer processed out of New Zealand, if we only relied on the traditional European and maybe even the US market, then prices would come down. So if we are going to grow to that extent, then the key to keeping the price up or optimising the price would be to develop new markets that would then be able to spread the extra, extra supply. So where are those markets? Asia obviously could offer some opportunity there. Um, we're, as part of the PGP and as part of our own programs, we're about to do some research, more research on the Chinese market. None of those are guaranteed successes, of course, but they are potential opportunities that if we got our, our, our foot, foot in the door in China 
and a program going up there, then obviously it's a, it's a very big market. Having said that, the, the, the risk there is it's not a, typically it's not a traditional protein that the, most Chinese consumers eat. So it's, there's no short-term fix. If all of a sudden we, we doubled the volume without developing those markets, price would come down. But if, but if our market development in China is really successful, Andrew, the, the problem won't be too many deer. As, as my board member has said, the problem will be where will the deer come from? And just to that, Andrew, I, I may have misheard you, but I think you said your, your wife liked a big cheque and a small package, so I'm not too sure with one compensated <laughs> for the other. But, but just with regards to that... Good um, things come in small packages. Um, what we used to say consistently over the previous years when we had variation of kill is that, we, that firstly, it would be a great problem for us to have uh, if, if we're going to get an increase in deer numbers. 10% um, movement can... can generally be accommodated without too much impact on, on, on pricing. Once you go beyond 10% from one year to the next, you do distort markets um, and you do have some influence on pricing without, as, as Grant said, some radical change and some dramatic um, you know, development of a new market, such as China. I think, I think just from an industry point of view, there's one really important point here, Andrew. In order to to grow the volume that much in any livestock industry, as opposed to milk where you can turn the tap on and off, you actually have to short the market significantly, because the only way we could grow volume that much would be to have a hell of a big retention. The worst thing that could happen to this industry is to continue with a hind kill for two years, then suddenly do a whole heap of retention of females, which makes the job for the people up the front so difficult, because they've suddenly got over the next two or three years, uh, sorry, in, in the short term, a lot to deal with, a little bit to deal with, and then a lot to deal with again. So it's about consistency, and so if we can, as an industry, look further ahead and say, well, it's worth a little bit of short-term pain for the long-term gain, then uh, consistency of volumes is, is important for these people, I think. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, Andy. The biggest problem we could ever have is a supply gap. You can argue about price, you can argue about quality, supply gap would kill it. So big hind retention would be very problematic. Sorry, I misunderstood your question about, uh, I thought it was more about a processing question. Marketing, yes, it's only a 15,000 tonne industry. If you doubled it to 30,000 tonne in a short time, we'd have problems. Incremental increase with the extension of the markets is manageable. Scotty. I'd uh, just like to say thanks for all the work that's been going on. Um, Silver Fern Farms, I really appreciate the premium packaging and the way it's been presented to the New Zealand consumer. I think it's great. Um, one little question. I see that our major process is Alliance PPCS, so both um, linking both sheep meat marketing, lamb, beef, in with their venison in an attempt to create efficiencies. I've just had a sudden nightmare of getting run over by a mob of stampeding sheep because what happens when the board's sitting up there, they've got an awful lot of grumpy sheep farmers who are the majority of their shareholders who are not getting anywhere near enough money for their lamb and they want that stuff moved really quick. What happens to the efforts of everybody who are also supposed to be shifting our venison and we're just a handful of little suppliers sitting somewhere at the bottom of the queue? I think I'm loud enough to uh, make a difference of sort of how we talk about lamb, beef and venison. And as I said, I talk about a brand. And yes, there's issues in all industries and all categories, but uh, we've got to have the strength of that at the top level of what we're talking about. So we're talking about a premier selection range. And um, we, I don't differentiate that. The marketing team is about all three categories, whereas we have the sales team that look after the sales of the different ones. So it gets an equal attention of our time. Yeah, we take a similar view. I mean, uh, we put a lot of focus on the venison, but the other species help because it's a product range extension. So we're opening doors with our lamb, the venison tax on. So when we're under the pump with the, with the ovine, not necessarily a bad thing because the focus is still on product movement, two market sectors, and they go hand in hand. Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd just support Sharon in that the um, the material she's she's put up is is you see those things in in three equal volumes in terms of the visual image, um, but in terms of so we're fair and Anne Alliance's turnover, they're not they're not equal at all. <clears throat> anyway, next one. Oh, down the back, John Somerville again. Oh, sorry, David. Uh, yeah, just I want to reiterate what Scotty said, but um, good job you're doing. So if we're going to flat, you know, spread the shoulders of the season a bit, um, and some guys are, Steve said about payments in three months, would it work if we um, looked at quarter, quarterly payments and and then the processes could um, lock lock currents? Yep. So then you sort of get a, um, a pool payment type thing plus or a minimum payment, and if if the currency doesn't go against us, we might have a top up. So could could you could you split the season into four now, instead of the two. So I think um, well maybe maybe we'll let no anyone anyone who wants. But I know there are multiple different options amongst these guys about how you get paid at the moment. And I suppose we've talked to um, our market, and I know First Light is the same. We're very much working together on that European one. Uh, our customer over there, Loyton, would like us to go to three seasons. So we're working with him on what's the best thing and how we can do it with procurement as well. So uh, he has the idea that, and we need to talk really closely with them on what is the right thing for the market. Um, and he has an idea of teaching with three seasons and what's really important in his market. So that's where we're looking at at the moment is three seasons. I just think you've got to be careful about introducing a whole layer of complexity in, into companies and, and breaking it down into quarterly pool payments, etc. David, you know, at the moment you've got a price on, on a weekly basis which is a combination of the market price and at times a bit of procurement tension. And if you try to even that out and say, well, look, I'm willing to take a, an, an average price across um, whatever that uh, three month period may be, I think it's going to be, a, it's a challenge from a management perspective. Uh, particularly in small companies to administer, but also I, I don't know that it, it, it would necessarily give you benefit. And the, the question of currency is another is another question, whether you take a good decision or a bad decision where the New Zealand dollar is going to increase or decrease at that time. I, I think you might have, I don't think I got it over quite right. What I meant was um, like the farmer commits for a quarter, um, so you guys can do you know you've got it, so you know what to do with your, with your markets, you know what to do with your money and exchange. Um, you can still do your weekly, but you, you've, you've got quarterly commitments. You know, I think we're in that new era, you, you, we need to come up with something different if we're going to spread the shoulders of this market in, because, uh, because of some of the physical um, constraints of production as well. So just speaking for our company, we have that already in terms of, of, of contract, committed supply, contract. Which isn't which isn't price, but it is a commitment from the farmer to deliver, and when those animals will come in, and as a guarantee of space um, on that commitment. So we have we have that planned, which provides us with quite a lot of certainty in terms of what stock's going to come and when. Jared. Yeah, I think um, as Glenn said, we've all got our own options out there, but but certainly as we get uh, deeper into the market, diversify our markets, then we're going to get more and more price stability. Uh, which ultimately then needs to exchange rate as a variable. Um, you know, we've, we've certainly, uh, our, in our producer group, we're 15 months forward covered. Uh, that's our policy. Um, and if an individual farmer came to me today and was willing to sign a legal contract, then I'll cover the effects for him today as well. But it needs to be, you know, it needs to be formal and firm. So certainly it's doable, but it's probably doable for us all. Down the bat. Oh, John and John. Who's going first? John Faulkner. You've already had a turn, John Sumrall. I had enough, John. I think you've got some great job, well presented. No one's asked the hockey sit back waiting for the big question. All the positive stuff you do in the marketplace, all the feedback you get. When do you think, like six months, 12 months, five years down the track, we're going to see an increase in our train tracks between our, our children trading the rest of the season? Can you repeat the question? So, um, yeah. when, when are we going yeah. to see an increase in yeah. 
We'll give John the mic and he can have a go on. So, John, I think what you're asking is when are you going to narrow that gap between the chilled price and the non-chilled season price? No, that's the last thing I want to see is a terminal side, Brett. <laughs> I'm actually asking the question, when are we going to see a lift in the, both the tram tracks? The last sort of few years it's been sitting around $6.50 to $7.50. When are we going to see, with all the positive stuff you guys are doing, a lift in scheduled prices? And not a seasonal lift, I know it's going to lift soon, but... I mean an annual lift. Glenn, you got the mic. <laughs> so to start, um, next year we, we w look like we will have a decrease in production following on from a decrease in production this year, th this year. So there's going to be less product available for markets and markets are going to therefore have a, a stronger demand balance. And if, if, if That's we can been happening for the last... 11 years. No, it hasn't. No. You've actually had about 420,000 animals killed each year for about the last four or five. So it's been very consistent. And the first three or four months of this year were, were no different to that. So the, the, the fall is likely to occur in the back half of this year and continue on into next year. So you are going to have less product in the, in the se second six months of this year, and it would appear considerably less product available next year. That, that will create stronger demand and, and with all the work that's going on in the markets. If you combine that with a continuation of the current trend, which is a falling New Zealand dollar, um, I, I think you know, that will have a, a positive impact next year on schedules throughout the year. Uh, anyone else? Grant? Yeah, probably not too much to add because I pretty much agree with all that. Um, we are seeing lifts in prices now in market. Um, exchange rate goes one way or the other and either adds to it or dilutes that. But right now, market prices generally are lifting for most of the cuts. It's not startling or, or dramatic, but it is firming and, and going in the right direction. And as Glenn was saying, next year we, we think that will continue. Um, what we don't want to see is prices spiking and going too, too high too fast, because when that happens, the bubble pops and it all of a sudden crashes. As soon as prices get too high, restaurants take venison off the menus. And when they do that, we can't sell it. And when that happens, the price just crashes. So we've got to be careful. Volatility is our enemy. Slow, steady increases is what we're, what we're after. But all that, sorry, sorry, my question's slightly wrong, but all that is not marketing. That's just straight out supply. Your, the excuse you're using is a falling dollar and a falling, and a falling supply. I'm saying, when are we going to see lifts Excluding those two excuses. <laughs> I get your point. Um, so really the, 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 the change in the, in the revenue going forward, apart from what I've already explained, will come from value-added products and each of the company's ability to capture value from that value-added activity. I mean, it's one thing creating what you've seen here this morning in terms of programs that, that create value. It's another thing and probably even more challenging to actually capture that value back here in New Zealand. So our ability to execute some of these plans and how successful they are in each market will, will be the, the determination of, of when that price comes back. It's, it's difficult to predict. When you're starting up new markets, you're creating a, a blue ocean opportunity where you haven't been before. So whilst you can plan and analyse and put in a, an educated forecast as to what you think you know, it's going to sell. At the end of the day, you're relying on consumers to actually buy that product and pay a high price for it. That's not an exact science. So some of these market, new market initiatives, some of them will work and some of them won't. If all of them work, that I guess right across all our companies, if all our initiatives that we're currently seeding work, we're going to very quickly turn around that, that price initiative. Um, they won't all work, we'll have some failures, that's that's the fact of life. Um, so it is going to be year by year uh, growing some of those new value-added opportunities. Yeah, I'd have to concur with most of what we've heard already, but I think the real opportunity, we're, we're targeting high value here and thinking about jilled, of course, high-end cuts, expensive cuts. There's a big opportunity in that uh, shoulder, B trim, flap, A trim, it's undervalued at the moment, so I think we've got a, our co-products, our offals, there's benefits there as well. So I think when we extract that, we've got a chance of lifting that base schedule up without having to worry about the um, 
the big end, the big, you know, the supply for and the demand creating an artificial price. So I think, you know, there's, um, there's probably, I don't like to put figures around it, but there's some, there's some quite quick gains and, maintain, and they're easy to maintain, I think, once we get that sorted out. Um, John, can I just have a quick go? I mean, this is one of the challenges in, in, in value adding is how, how much do you, how can you measure what sort of difference it's making? Um, and as you've said, prices go up and down according to supply and demand and all sorts of currency and bits and pieces. So how do you disentangle that and say, well, the investment we've made in market development has made X amount of difference? Well, it's quite hard. But in terms of the strategy that I described to you for P2P market development, the idea is to create demand at, so at, at times and places outside of that current peak <laughs> chilled season. So we will be able to measure whether we're succeeding on that front um, by observing the fraction of chilled sales. So does that go up? And consequent to that, does the shape of our seasonal price curve actually change? So if you're getting demand for chilled product outside of that August to October period, that will come through on the schedule. And that's how we will measure our success. Tomorrow, Patty. <laughs> well, P2P program, th what, what's written down in our business case, Patty, is, um, as Jared said, European side 300 tonne, um, Chinese side similar over a seven year period. Um, as I said earlier, I think those targets are, are imminently achievable. Uh, we've got another one down the back. Yep. Yeah, hi, I um, just uh, want to talk to you about the Chinese market. Um, sort of heard very little on the strategy of what's being done to enter into the Chinese market. I know it's a very large market and just didn't get a, a lot of, a lot from you guys on the strategy, you know, what, what's being done to enter, enter into that market. It's fair, fair to say that uh, through the P2P we don't really have one yet. The plan is um, to do some market research and then do, do tr trials on a piloting basis. But some of these guys actually have, prior to P2P, have extensive experience in China. So I'll let them take that away. Thanks, Dan. Hey, you may have heard we've got a, an importer in north of China, up in Harbin, called Gram Farm. They have quite an extensive R&D department. So I've been putting product up there over the last 18 months, from bones, offals, various meat cuts, and I don't want to impose European specifications on our Chinese friends. I want them to come back to me with what works in that market. So that's more for the mass market, and that's where we can make some quite quick gains. Our other strategy, we're coming through Southeast Asia. We're uh, already in Hong Kong. We want to uh, work with a company that's got six bases in China and just um, have a look at the top end as well. So it's a two-pronged approach. Top end, five-star, four-star restaurant, and a product for the mass market because there's big opportunity there. But it's like turning an oil tanker, it's quite slow and we need them to come to us with what works in their market. Yes, yeah, so we're, we've only been uh, doing business up in China with venison for uh, only the recent times, the last six months or so, because we've only just got our, our venison plant certified for China. Um, at the moment we're sending a container load of uh, some of the lower value cuts into China once every month or two. So it's, it's slowly but steadily building. Um, it's fair to say in most parts of China, venison isn't a protein of choice and it's got pretty low awareness in the uh, cities like Shanghai, etc. We are doing a lot of research. I think Sharon will talk shortly about some of the research that we're doing with uh, chefs and consumers and, and plan to do in the future. But... Whatever we do in China, I think it'll be a long game. It's going to take uh, many years to develop the market so that venison is one of the key proteins they do buy. Um, as an example, we went to a trade show where we had our, our beef and our lamb and we uh, decided to put venison on, on the stand as well. It was interesting to see the reaction of, of not just consumers in China but chefs to venison being cooked up it would be fair to say that even though most Chinese pretty much eat all sorts of different animals, when it come to venison, most of them didn't want to touch it. They, they kind of reacted how we would react to probably cat or dog. It was literally like that. So for most of them, it's not a meat that they would ever consider eating. So we've got to be careful that 
We don't treat China as one country. Again, we've got to segment. And there will be segments, consumer and, sh and parts of China that, that no doubt we will be able to develop a market in, but it won't be mainstream by any stretch. It won't be like beef, it won't, won't be like lamb. And we've, we have started the research on um, premium consumers up in China. And we did a massive study last year, which included focus groups talking to the Chinese, uh, Quan, and talking in-depth interview, uh, interviews with chefs. Uh, the awareness is so small that it's scary. And we did a lot of personification research with the consumer. They have no awareness. So don't think that we should rush and we need to do it reasonably well. The chefs, they challenged us on why would we pay a higher price for this protein when we have a Wagyu beef. You know, that's our alternative in here. So we've actually got to prove the worth of what this protein is for those Chinese premium consumers. Uh, we, also, we could put our retail packs online tomorrow. Uh, our partner would like to do that and try it. We have to make sure that we make the awareness and we don't, we know it would fail if we went up there and did that now. So we've got to be very careful. Whenever you're doing marketing of a brand, you also don't want to do something that's obviously not going to work till we do some education. And that's hence why it needs to be done properly. Got another one, Tony, uh, from online the, one. From the internet, uh, Andrew Swallow uh, on the questions of image. Uh, is the panel concerned by the use of grain in winter crops such as fodder beet as a finishing feed given the increasing emphasis on grass fed and free range in venison marketing? Jared and Sharon and Terry. <laughs> from an alliance point of view, uh, we include forage crops as in our grass feed system, so we're quite relaxed about that. Yeah, we're the same, and, and we've actually done quite a lot of consumer taste panels on fodder beet in particular to see what taste and eating quality changes it may create. Um, to date, we've only found positives. It generally outperforms grass on eating quality traits, particularly with beef because it brings that marbling through a bit better. Um, but there's definitely no detrimental aspects to, to those winter forages that we've discovered so far. We use the USDA definition for grass fed, and so USDA definition does allow uh, forage crops, it allows uh, fodder beets to be included in grass fed. Um, essentially, it'll allow right to the point of a, a whole crop silage, maize silage, um, as long as the, the maize is still milky. So we're happy to work to that level. Uh, when it comes to addition of grain, it's a different market. Yes, we still utilise the, the grain feeding, but it is obviously a, a, something we can't put the grass fed uh, label alongside. So important delineation between the two. Thank you. Um, John Somerville, sorry then, Graham. <laughs> okay, I've got a question, just change tact on co-products. Um, just over the last four or five years, the, the, the uh, total value of our exports of co-products has steadily increased um, and, and over a, on a pretty steady kill number. I'm just asking the processes, has this been passed on in our schedules, this increase? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's always it's always included, John. I think there's some confusion because you may not see it as, as something which is itemised on a kill sheet, but it's always included. Um, it's always a component of, of what that weekly schedule is, to uh, in including the value of the meat to the different markets, the different currencies, and the value of the co-product. So you have got a steady increase in the value of co-products, which has been passed on. At the same time, we've now got a, a quite a significant decrease in the value of deer skins. Uh, which have roughly halved in the last 12 months. So one, the increase in one is, is helping to cover the decrease in another. Uh, Graham, we've got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, just a quick one then. Um, I'd just like to focus the, uh, the members on the panel on the, on the US market. Um, it's very interesting to see that you're now going, focusing certainly at Lawrence and Silver Ferns are really now making a push in this direction. There's been other people been in there for years and uh, quietly been very successful. Um, to me, that's, that's pretty exciting, but there are two issues that concern me. One is, I'd hate to see um, the boys now that are coming in there um, trying to get a market share at the expense of the people that have already been there for some time, and therefore it becomes just a means of uh, 
uh, of no more real product, but just a lower price, more competition. We've seen that in the past. I do believe um, we might have matured out of that. I hope so. Um, the other thing is that it's a, it sort of fits in very well with the Savannah concept that now you're all pushing. It is a Savannah area. Um, it's interesting to hear that you're all talking very positively about the market. I mean, that's a huge, huge market of people that know what venison and know what deer is. Uh, I don't um, discourage the work that's going on in China. I think it's still got a, got a lot of potential. But you've got a market there which we nibble at the edges. It is huge, potentially huge for us. It's, it's, they speak our language. They eat and they shoot. Um, they are very big barbecues. So why don't they, why don't you produce the product that you're doing for Hanos for those people in America as well? The market seems to me, you, 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 I'm glad to see you're focusing that way, but I'd like to see the two questions to answer. Are you going to really drive that one? Seems to me the obvious way to di 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 diversify from Europe. And secondly, do I get assurance that you're not going to be fighting amongst yourself for the same, the same amount? Yeah, from Silver Fern Farms' perspective, the USA for venison is our number one priority. So it's above all the other things we've been talking about uh, around China, etc. It is our biggest opportunity to grow and grow at the high end. Our whole strategy is to create new channels to US consumers. So the Fresh Direct example, that goes home, you know, delivered to, to consumers' homes via the internet, that sort of thing. Um, we're working very closely with our partners in the US including the lamb company that we're partnering up with Alliance, etc. So there is a fair amount of uh, collaboration going on at the same time that we're cutting a new path in, in various new channels. 100% it's, we're only doing it to, to get that top end, otherwise there's no point. We know we can sell all our product now pretty much into Europe at European prices, but we are going to divert into the US if we can get a premium price, but only if we can get a premium price, otherwise putting in all, all that effort just to create a new market at the same price, there's no real point to that. So all our effort is at the top end. It's new channels, and again, we think it's currently our number one opportunity for Silver Fern. Yeah, from an alliance perspective, we have got a strong focus on the US as well, for those reasons you mentioned. But our growth is natural, not forced. So we're not at that uh, primitive stage where we're going to chase each other's business and, and uh, cannibalise the operation up there. So rest easy, it's new business, it's extensions, it's high end. Well, it's both ends of the spectrum, actually. We've also got some action in the lower end. Better options in Europe. Takes the currency risk out of it. Product spread, so it's good. And, of course, it's not seasonal. So now it's big focus, but it's natural, not forced. Uh, Graham, the other thing is that we have... Um really been promoting as in the summer barbecue season, which we've just been doing um, the last three weeks in, in the USA. All the cuts that we used were really um, focused on barbecue, um, lesser cuts from the animal which have been uh, not previously sold as premium barbecue items, um, the likes of ribs, uh, breast meat, uh, well, brisket rather, um, and even offals. Um, have really got a place in that market and um, some of the leg cuts that we've previously been lumping in with the Denver leg, we're singling them out and selling them as pre-portioned barbecue cuts that chefs ex know exactly what to do with because they do use them in beef which is the mo and pork. So um, we have the products and that fit that market and the companies that we've been working with are flat out promoting those so it's only going to give us a better um, value across the carcass as well, and hopefully that will in turn um, lift the you know the, the profitability from the whole animal using those other cuts that were previously being sold as trim into a premium item to be used in the summer months. Because remember, in the summer, people are not going to spend the big dollar on on a, an item to throw on a barbecue. They'll take a risk on a lesser priced item, and um, they'll enjoy them just as much. All over, um, even the Midwest, which is uh, the, the cities, the, the northeastern sector of the US, um, the likes of uh, Washington, New York, and so on, they, they've had a fair amount of attention. Um, 
We're doing more work in the south and in the Midwest um, area on barbecue because that's um, where a lot of it's done. Um, we did several promotions this last trip in Florida, of all places, and happy to report that um, some of the young chefs that I work with are using the product all year round down there. They're not bothered by the season. Um, and there's a lot of good things happening out there. Um, and I think the future's bright. I mean, we've got young chefs out there that have um, been involved and, you know, they've gone to culinary schools, they've been exposed to our programs, to some of the programs we've been doing over the, up there for years. They're familiar with the product, they're very familiar with the brand and what it brings, the Savannah brand. They know it's a, a premium quality product, they know it by name, they ask for it by name, and they know they can utilise it in, all, in, in many different ways, and it's because it's not a wild shot animal. They know it's got a good safety record in terms of, you know, uh, food safety and so on, so they're, they're happy to work with it. And there's a lot of really adventurous young chefs out there coming along and um, we've just got to be part of that, part of that action. Be, make sure that we're with them. Right, we're out of time. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'd like to ask you to just give these guys a bit of a applause for. <laughs> for for coming up and putting their necks on the line. So thanks, guys. Your mm -hmm. your duty is fulfilled. <laughs>